Hello Internet! Welcome to my first programming talk, What Programming is Never About, by yours truly. My name is Abner Coimbre. Um, I am 23 years old and currently working for NASA's Kennedy Space Center in System Software Engineering for the Launch Control Center. Um, if you guys have seen I don't know, movies where you have the firing room at NASA where they're about to launch a rocket to save the world or redirect an asteroid. Um, that's Kennedy Space Center. That's basically where I am working. I'm one of the programmers for that uh, firing room. Um, that said, NASA does not explicitly affiliate with or endorse any of the content that I'm going to be presenting here in this talk. Um, it is solely my content and they are not affiliated with it necessarily. I will also not be discussing any NASA specific uh, or space related subject except maybe in like an, in an experiential kind of way like anecdotes and stuff like that. So I have had many friends um, that I've met um, over the years uh, who are interested in programming like I have been ever since I was 13. Um, and recently they've been asking me, whether at work or in other places, hey, uh, why don't you give us your two cents on what you have found to be true, or what you have found to be increasingly true about programming? And I'm like, okay, maybe I should do like an informal kind of talk. Um, and you can begin by answering that question, like what have you found out to be true about programming? By stating first, what programming is never about, or what it's just not about in general. Um, and that's what I'm going to do, basically. Um, I have a notebook, I have some notes, pretty much with like a map of, to keep track of stuff. I also have a timer. So you're going to see, and I also have a Mr. Monitor, so you're going to see me obviously moving in this direction, like looking at my notes to see where I am or stuff like that. So I apologize for that. Moving on. So. In order to say what programming is to me, um, or what it's never about, I mean, I have to say like what it is to me, like what do I think programming is, and the best way to do that is to actually program, uh, like now. If I program something, uh, how, no matter how easy it may be, you guys can sort of get an idea of what it means to me, and then we can go on from there. So for the Right? Now, what is programming in reality, right? as opposed to what I think? And here are some definitions that I found interesting and that I want to share with you guys. This one is from Dan North. He is somebody who is creating courses um, for people who have been uh, taught some methodologies in programming that have, we found out to be not very helpful and he's trying to like reason them out of that kind of those kinds of things right agile methodologies and so on and so forth and he uh, talks about uh, programming in the following well it seems to me the most successful programmers I've encountered don't craft software they write software in order to move information around in order to get something done Information is the real deal. The software just defines the space that it moves around in. For those programmers, success is about getting information from point A, where it's currently languishing, to point B, where it's going to actually be useful, as quickly and effectively as they can. If you noticed when I was, this is pretty much what I was doing in my programming. Uh, when I created the pixels for the screen, um, I was sort of having some information there. And if I wanted to change that data um, into something else, I would. I would uh, swap the pixels into a different color in order to create, let's say, a square. Um, or in the case of the spell checker, a sentence, a paragraph, or whatever, the highlighter when, it, when something is spelled wrong. 
Um, and then I would transport that data, even though if I let somebody else do it, some other library, I transport that data uh, somewhere else, to the screen, etc. Another definition that's interesting, this is Noel. Uh, I don't have his last name, unfortunately, but I will ask him for it, and this will be in the video description below. Programming, by definition, is about transforming data. It's the act of creating a sequence of machine instructions describing how to process the input data and creating specific output data. Um, again, this is pretty much straightforward. Um, if I have some input data, which is, let's say, something the user is typing, that could be transformed because that's pretty much a signal. That can be transformed into something that can be processed as a word, right? Like if the key that I press was A, um, it'll signal that for me and I can create some other set of data based on that A. I can create a character A and store it in an array, for example. So I'm just I'm processing input data and I'm creating some output data that will be transformed into some other form of data until finally it's something that the user can see, perceive, or if it's a simulation, something that can create uh, an interesting uh, simulation. Um, warning! This doesn't mean I'm writing in assembly or zeros and ones uh, all the time. Just because, like, I don't, I don't have to program that way, and using a using a very low-level language in order to understand that programming is about this kind of moving data around and transforming it. Um, data being whatever you know, the fonts, the the audio, it's just data. I don't really have to like use a low-level programming language to sort of understand that, right? Um, so that doesn't mean that I'm writing assembly all the time. Now, what is it never about? If you noticed, it really is never about the code. Now, before you go crazy on me, while it is true that the programming language we use as the tool for engaging in programming expresses like while it expresses constraints in how your mind solves problems because the programming language does that to you yeah it is still fundamentally not about the code itself but rather what you did with the code and you know given this talk you, you kind of found this to be obvious but if we go to educational materials um, books, some programming courses in some colleges, not everybody, but there's a trend. Uh, they place emphasis on code. And it's pretty bad. Um, and I think we're going to need some story time here um, of why it's pretty bad. Um, three short stories. Let's start with the video game health bar story. Um, again, a lot of books, a lot of educational materials focus on the code. Whether it is pretty in the sense of like, are you calling, are you writing the variables and your uh, and your data names in a way that is uh, consistent, which is important. But um, why are you not? Uh, why are you making lines longer than 120 characters? Why aren't you making your code model the real world? Right? Like in my previous program, if I was uh, creating these bit mark, these fonts to show on the screen, these sentences, then I know that they're just pixels with some attributes to them, some colors and some positioning. So I write the program doing the things necessary, like moving the sentence uh, to the right position or moving the caret to the right position uh, by creating some computations so the user can see that. But they would, you know, since they're focusing on the code, these materials, they always say, why didn't you call uh, your code or the code that processes that processes this um, font, you know, font uh, renderer, blah blah blah. And then why didn't you call functions like oh, display on screen for user? And you should probably do that in a camel case, which is like you st each word starts with like an uppercase letter. And, and they place a lot of emphasis on that. Um, and like calling your, your things into something that kind of models the real world, even though the computer does something completely different from what the real world would do. If that makes sense, that's pretty obvious. So for the video game health bar story, um, this was back when I was, before I left programming school. Um, 
I had a friend. Um, I, you know, in these in these programming classes, I, I got I got some interesting things out of college, but uh, out of the programming courses, since this was the thing that was happening with the code, with the you know pretty code and you know the the beautiful camel casing notation and stuff like that, I really didn't pay much attention to those classes at all. Um, so I would sit in the back of the row and just you know do the exams and move on. But I did make a friend, um, a very good friend, uh, who was also studying software engineering. And you know we 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 became partners for a game, and this game was a regular any other game with where the main character has a health bar. And so when I started programming, because uh, we needed to for that part of the course we had to like make the health bar, um, and then um, decrease it and increase it if it gets hit stuff like that. So I'm like okay, um, a health bar is really just a chunk of green, usually green, pixels spread out horizontally across your screen. And it'll change its size, if I think of it as a rectangle maybe, it'll change its size depending on what collisions happen with the player, if it was with a, an entity that was you know, evil or tried to hurt me, right? And so it was like, okay, this is pretty easy. And actually I had to do this in Java. So Java already has a lot of facilities for you. Um, one of them was a rectangle. And I'm like, okay, a health bar can be a rectangle of a, of a single color. So I made that rectangle. I made it green whenever I already had code for like the collision. So if the player got hit or that, or that collision event happened, then I would change the size of the rectangle. I would reduce it. If he stumbled across a, a power up, I would increase the size of that, uh, rectangle. Um, interestingly, Video games go in loops, right? Where each loop is a frame where it goes into three steps. You you grab input from the player, you simulate information based on that uh, input, and then you kind of show the results on the screen. So when I would reduce the size of the rectangle, it would go really fast, one frame after the other. So I kind of wanted to make it smooth. So I would just decrease the size of the rectangle over time because that's like the reasonable thing to do. That's what you have to do. And so I did, and in about two hours, I had a working, nice, animated health bar. And yeah, that was not too bad. You have this video game health bar, and the problem really was, after a week, I did it in two hours. Not that I'm the best, Some, anybody could do it in less than two hours, especially in Java. Um, you know, I was procrastinating and stuff. Um, my friend took a week, so I, I he kind of asked for help at the end, and I'm like, "What's going on?" And when I look at the code, it is this video game health bar uh, for the player class that was the name, and it was full of these functions, and they're usually called methods, um, where you call that, and then it performs some computations for you. Um, for those who don't know, and they would just call these weird things like increase health bar point by one, decrease health bar point by one. Um, somebody else made a joke like, oh, why didn't he uh, write realize the futility of existence when the player died, call the function that, <laughs> and stuff like that. And like he had this beautiful, I guess, according to the people who emphasize on the code, this beautiful code, I suppose, uh, verbose and explanatory, and whatever, but it, he didn't know how to how to make the computations or how to decrease the size of the health bar. Like he didn't even know that a health bar was can be just a rectangle. He was just thinking about the principles and the rules that the professor shoved down his throat. Um, I sort of saw this like blindfold in him. Like he he just didn't know how to proceed after he made the structure, and you know he did the structure, but like he didn't know how to make the computations because that's not the focus of the educational materials for the most part. What I said to him after that was like, dude, why don't you just grab the rectangle class, right? Call it, call it health bar, call the rectangle health bar if you want to, but it's just a rectangle, right? You can move the X and Y position if you want to. When the event of uh, collision happens, you already have that code. Go ahead and say that the size will be smaller when it, when it gains a, a 
you know, a health point or something increases as a direct angle. And when he heard me say that, I, I cannot forget because he just laid his face on my shoulder, sighed, right? And a little bit of tears and stuff like that coming out of him. And this is when I said, I have got to get out of here. I have got to leave programming school and I have to go work and do something a little bit more productive and not spend so much money on this kind of stuff. And okay, I'm going to end the rant there. Um, this is not true of every place, but it is a trend that I've noticed in my years of working and being in school. Um, yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Don't get too scared. I, if you, if you want to study computer science and stuff in, say, an American university, that's fine. Just be careful with the programming courses because it's becoming increasingly true that the material there is not like the best. Um, story number two: a screensaver retail. Um, it's pretty much, I'm going to kind of skip it, I'll say what it's about, it's usually when I talk to people, uh, I ask them, how would you implement a, a screensaver or a slideshow? Uh, I, I, would I would tell a, a, a young programmer or something, right? I mean, I'm young too, but, you know, somebody who's like 17 or something. Um, how would you do this? Like, you're in college right now, you're a freshman, or, you, or you're, you're a junior and you already took, you know, advanced programming. How would you make a screensaver? And again, we go back to the classes and the code and how it looks and you know what to call it. And I'm like, no, um, a slideshow is just a transitioning between images, and you can see an image as a matrix, right, of n rows by n columns, where each grid is just a pixel. It has finite structure, which means a computer can go ahead and transition it by swapping pixels from one to another. And you can ask other interesting questions, like what if one matrix is larger than the other? How do you transition between one image that's smaller than the other and stuff like that, right? Um, when you actually implement the code, right, make, make the computations, it's interesting because it'll, you'll see the transition happen too quickly, which means if you know about programming and how, what it is and hardware, um, you kind of have to sleep the CPU in a naive way if you want to between rows, right? So you swap pixels between one row and you pause and you go on to the next row. And then you swap the pixels and you go on to the next row. And then you kind of see this transition happening, right? Which is very interesting. And you can ask other interesting questions, which has nothing to do with the code. But like you do have to know, um, what if you want to do the transition, you know, from left to right in a vertical motion? And you can't swap complete rows and paths. You have to swap complete columns and paths. What if you want to make it diagonal? Well, you might have to increase, you know, start transitioning and going all the way back and then start shrinking again because, you know, diagonally, you're, you're, you're growing and shrinking, if that makes sense. Uh, and then once I tell them now, it's like, oh, this isn't really hard. Um, if you didn't understand what I said, go rewind. Listen to me again, because I'm talking pretty fast here. It's, you know, it's straightforward. It's not difficult. Wow. But, you know, number three, and this is the part that made me kind of want to do the talk. Um, it's the poor electrical engineering student who never saw it coming. A friend of mine who is not a uh, a computer engineer or you know he, he he was in school as an electrical engineer. He wasn't doing any kind of programming. Um, but he had to do some programming for some of his you know hardware, MATLAB, stuff like that. And he was pretty good. Um, he wasn't indoctrinated in this kind of like code is everything thing, right? And you know he did pretty well. His code wasn't wasn't bad. Um, I mean, his implementation, his problem solving skills weren't bad. So he actually got the job done. But when he would show uh, some of my friends uh, or even full timers already programmers his code, it was again placing emphasis on, oh my God, how how could you use a single go to over there, or how could you ever you know use so many nested ifs or fors and stuff like that. That's that's kind of. And then he came to me like you know kind of depressed thinking that he did a good job, and he did in problem solving. Um, but you know, the, the fact that my fellow peers, um, I'm not talking about uh, NASA here, they're spooky smart people at NASA. I'm talking about before NASA, and you know, you always have one or two people, even at NASA, come in and they kind of have this idea, but we, we quickly get rid of it, right? Um, but yeah, I still have a lot of friends who, you know, stayed in college and stuff like that, and I, it's just kind of depressing that this is the workforce that we kind of might get, not because it's their fault, but because the, the educational materials are kind of this bad, right? 
Hopefully that didn't depress you. It depresses me every time I talk about it. But, you know, if what you need to do to solve a problem in programming, again, rendering something on the screen, simulating a rocket launch simulation, if, if since I guess you're not thinking about the code if you're actually programming per se, as it's supposed to be, um, then you know what steps it's going to take to get a simulation done, right? And that might be a thousand lines. And if nobody else is going to use that, then you would stick that thousand lines in the function because that's what the function needs to do. And again, when I show this to other people, some of my friends, if I can show that to them, if I'm allowed to, um, they will say, oh my god, a thousand lines. And I'm like, no, the books and some of the courses going on, it's just plainly horrendous. It's heinous. I cannot take it anymore. And we have to do something about this. But don't take it just for me. We are going to talk about Handmade Hero. If you don't know about Handmade Hero, you should go right now, handmadehero.org. Um, Casey Muratori is the person in charge of Handmade Hero. He is also well known for many other things. He will be in the video description below. Um, this is basically a series, a programming series, where you do everything from scratch using the kind of straightforward problem solving mentality that I've been talking about. Um, now, a lot of students are interested in what he's doing, so they ask questions at the end of a stream because this is a programming stream on Twitch like I'm doing now. Um, and yeah, so he gets a lot of questions as well, and I have some audio clips of him answering those questions. And I, I'm not blaming the students or the person who asked them, who asked them this, like who asked this themselves. Like I'm, I'm. What's problematic is like the contents that they've been shoved down their throats, like I said before. So if, I'm not really blaming them when these questions are asked. Um, just to kind of make that point. So here's some of the questions while I drink water because I'm half drunk. Um, let's play some of the audio clips. Of again, this is like this is what you get when you place the emphasis on the code rather than the problem solving. Here's one of the questions. Um, dun, 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 dun. Something that, you know, I, I said that programming is a lot about data and transforming data. And, you know, the way computer handles data is, you know, with memory. Um, for some reason, people are scared about memory. And they always say, you know, memory is, is scary. Um, and Casey basically handles memory in a very straightforward way. So people ask him, you know, why are you memory, managing memory yourself and stuff like that when you should have the language do it for you, stuff like that, right? Mm. Hopefully you can hear this, I'm loading here. You are using a lot of pointers here. How are you managing the memory regarding leaks and UMR, etc.? I think he's well, visibly we, confused, um, shocked. I'm not really sure I understand the question. So, I guess I'll kind of give a general answer. The way we're doing things, we just use a memory block. So we don't have we don't have any memory leaks. Like that memory drop gets free, freed at the end. There's no way we can leak the memory. Um, so there isn't. I mean, this is something that I guess that uh, I, I don't know. You kind of just have to watch and see how I do it. I guess as we go forwards. But people often ask me this question. They're like, "How do you manage memory, or how do you deal with garbage not having garbage section, all that sort of stuff?" There's no memory to manage in a game. Like games typically just they create their stuff and then they run. There isn't any memory to manage. It's usually just people sort of misunderstanding the basic way that you should probably program things, I feel like, when you have lots of memory getting allocated and stuff like this that has to get managed and freed in that way. Um, and so if you'll notice, I've never allocated any memory that has to get freed. I've never done anything that requires tracking of pointers or anything like that. Um, and that's intentional. This whole game will be structured in a very clean way such that that sort of stuff never happens. Uh, so there won't ever be any leaks because there won't ever be any allocations, if that makes sense. Uh, when we create the world, the world will get created as one in this in this block. And when uh, you close that down and go to a new one, it'll just jettison the entire block in, as a whole and start a new block, right? So you never have to worry about freeing forests of things 
uh, which is where you need garbage collection and stuff to help you if you are getting confused or whatever. You don't, you just don't ever do those things. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, this is why a lot of times I guess people find it weird, but I don't think about memory management. Memory management just isn't an issue. Um, how much memory I'm using is always an issue, uh, but that's because I always try to think about th keeping things constrained. Like, um, I always try to think about let's keep everything inside like 64 megs or something like that. And that's always something that you have to work on and think about because using how much memory you actually need is a, is a problem. But freeing it and managing ownership and that sort of stuff is just... You should never even think about that or even have to think about that. If you're thinking about that, you probably did something wrong in your architecture and you should rethink <laughs> it, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and so you'll just have to kind of trust me that that's true and you can see as I go that I always have a good s solution for that at all times and that I'm never in this situation where I'm like, oh, and then we have to free the thing and, oh, but that points to other things and those have to get freed. You never, like, don't, don't do that. Just never, ever write that code. Um, because it's, it's uh, basically like it's, it's not necessary. And when you write it, um, either you have to use a language that has garbage collection because you can't manage it yourself because it's too complicated or something. Um, and that incurs all these costs for the garbage collection and all these other things that don't have to happen. You're just wasting uh, the user's time running all that stuff like the garbage collector. collector. Or if you're writing a language without garbage collection, you're making a ton of more work for yourself, having to remember what's getting freed and what's not, or using all these smart pointers to do all these checks, uh, and those checks incur extra cost, and you're just incurring all this extra cost, all this extra work that the CPU does or that you're doing mentally, all that stuff that never needed to happen. So just don't write that code. Like, never write that code. Um, write it this way, and then you never have to worry about it. And, and then you never have to worry about it. Here's another question. It's not as long, um, and that he answered as well. And think about again the question that the user is asking. It has to do more about emphasis on the code, and then Casey kind of replies back in a way of like problem solving more about than the code itself. Um, so yeah, let's find it over here. Here you go. What's your threshold for number of function parameters before putting them all into a single structure as a single function parameter? If you're calling a function, you sometimes pass values into it. Sometimes those values can be massive. You can pass in 10 values, 15 values. Um, and then on the code, it looks like an extremely long you know, uh, parameter list, because it is a long parameter list. And the user is asking, like, how, when do you stop and create a structure uh, a way to pack that information is so like you, uh, you're going to only pass like one single thing instead of those 15 things. And this is his answer. Uh, I don't really have a threshold for that. I'm rarely thinking about that when I do that. What I'm thinking about is whether there will be a lot of times when things will get passed through as that structure. So basically, if I think of a lot of people will be passing around the same group of stuff, then I'll condense it into a structure. But if a function itself just happens to have a unique set of stuff, even if it's 30 long, I don't care. I'll, I'll just use them as, um, I'll just do them as, uh, as individual parameters. So it's not really about how many, func how many parameters a function has. It's whether those things can be bundled together in ways that lots of people use. Because then that just condenses the code and it's nicer. Last audio clip. So you can sort of get the idea of the state of the education materials out there. Um, again, the idea of like beautiful code, clean code. Um, you might be wondering, well, I don't want, I don't want you to problem solve and then have a messy code. Um, and then C Casey already answered that in, in a way that I, I don't think I can answer. He, he did it fantastic. So this is the last one I'll put and continue with the talk. We're almost done actually. Um, so I gotta manually scrub to find it. Almost there. Found it. Real, real chunks that, that happen. And by the way, this is a good point to mention this. Um, somebody was saying in the on the forums uh, a while back that they felt like the code was too messy. And uh, again, I really want to stress the fact that. Uh, I don't really want to try to tell people that the way that they code is wrong because, you know, I, I feel like that just leads to a lot of pedantic arguments that aren't particularly constructive. 
But what I can say is nobody, in my mind, nobody should be thinking that this code is messy. This code is exactly what it should be. It's code that we are writing to figure out how we want to structure our program. And if you're spending time right now thinking about how to make this code not messy, whatever that means to you, um, then essentially what you're doing is you're wasting time, right? You're spending time that should have been spent thinking about the problem, thinking about the code. And the end state, the end goal of your program is not to have killing code. It's to have good working code. Cleanliness has nothing to do with those things. If you have the ugliest code in the world that someone would look at and call very messy, but it has no bugs and runs great, then it didn't matter, right? And so to the point that we care about how clean code is, we only care about that as insofar as it has an effect on our end product. Insofar as it has an effect on our end product. That is, the problem we are trying to solve. And what we know right now is what we're trying to do is just define the structure of the code. So none of this code will ship in the game, or if it does, it's because it got pulled out and like changed around a little and you know put in its proper place. And so we know that it will clean up over time as we know what it should be. But prematurely cleaning it, it's actually worse than just wasting time. It may lead us down wrong paths and, and end us to end up having us to, uh, making us have to do gyrations to make stuff work together because we've segregated it in a bad way too early on. And so I really want to stress that fact that like if you if if the way you look at code is that you think of it as messy or clean, that is a very bad habit in my opinion. Um, and so all I can really do is say as strenuously as possible, stop thinking that way. Instead, think about the problem you're trying to solve. When you are done and to your satisfaction, solving that problem in however messy a way as you can, then that is the time to start thinking about cleanliness of code. And what we mean when we say cleanliness of code there is, can I find the bugs in it easily? Is it easy to read and understand? Is it easy for me to reuse in the places that I need to reuse it? Those sorts of things. And never some set of prescribed things that somebody said was clean code, because there is no such set. There is no, uh, there is no set of rules that tells you whether a particular set of code is clean based on what the code looks like. It's only based on what the usage looks like and what the debugging process looks like that actually tells you whether a piece of code is clean or not. And I really can't stress that enough. It's a big difference between um, good programmers and bad programmers is whether they understand this, right? Uh. Um, that's almost a summary of my talk, pretty much, what he just said, right? Now, how to solve it? Are there any potential solutions for the state of the programming education materials out there? Um, yes, we kind of need experts. We need people who have programmed for a long time. They see it as their craft or their trade, they're skilled at it, and they need to go ahead and program um, and show people how it's done. Um, and that's already happening, right? There's there's a lot of programming streams on Twitch, there's a lot of blog posts from expert programmers showing how they actually problem solve using code, using programming uh, activities. So that's very important, that's very nice. Um, however, and I need to go full screen here. I have my chat up. How do I go full screen? There we go. Okay. However, there is one thing called <clears throat> the curse of knowledge. Uh, this is from Steven Pinker. You guys should know him. He's a fantastic scientist. Um, in his recent uh, book, Sense of, The Sense of Style, he talks about the curse of knowledge. And what happens is, once you, you're adept and you're very skilled at a craft, you adopt terminology that uh, you forget that a lot of people that are beginning don't really comprehend. And even if you explain it, let's say, once, they kind of need to see where that terminology came from before they actually start using it naturally. Um, and then programming, programming is not an exception, right? We have a lot of uh, terminology like exception and uh, bitmap fonts. What is a bitmap font? But just pixels, right? Um, texture atlas, which is also just a chunk of pixels, but they're used in different contexts, and that's why we give them those names. But the people who are starting, they kind of don't know that because they don't have the experience, and they don't see why it's called that. 
until they actually start doing the things that sort of say, oh, this is like a texture atlas, so I'm going to call it an atlas, you know. So the curse of knowledge is, is very pervasive. Um, Handmade Hero is kind of an exception. He, he's very good, fantastic at explaining uh, many of the things. Um, even so, the, the subjects are, are, are pretty difficult. If you kind of want to transition between all of the emphasis that you place on the code back to kind of problem solving, that takes a while. And I have gotten a lot of emails. Um, I'm not even kidding. Over 100. I'm not kidding. Across these years of me programming, over 100 emails. And conversations from friends and, you know, messages and stuff. You know, is there a book? Um, is there a book that I can use in order to sort of program and just program? Like, not focus too much on the code because if you program problem solving correctly, the code kind of, you know, cleans up over time, like Casey said. So is there a book that I can use that sort of teaches this kind of thing, this data-orient design kind of thing? And um, kind of the answer is that there isn't really. I've looked for a good book on data-oriented design using, let's say, a language that allows it, <laughs> uh, like C. Um, and there's, bit, there's bits and bits, you know, here and there. There's blog posts and articles. Um, but like, I haven't really seen a good book on that. And so when people are asking me, like, potential solutions for this, um, again, the experts like Casey Mortoy from Handmade Hero, um, Jonathan Blow, using creating his new programming language, which you'll see in the video description. You have a lot of people, a lot of experts, working hard to sort of, you know, improve the quality of the materials, uh, of the education materials for programming. But there hasn't really been a good uh, book about it. And if I can go to the next slide, that would be awesome. Um, we have to kind of bridge the gap and have a way for people to, like, a kind of intervention, like for people who, who you know, were dogmatized with some of these principles and rules that kind of don't make any sense, and sort of go back to this kind of straightforward programming. Um, we need a book for that, you know. And this is pretty much the end of the talk. I'm just going to say what I want to do um, as part of this effort to try to make more, you know, more interesting quality material for programmers. Um, I, I used to be a reviewer for this book um, that you see on the screen. Um, Pact Publishing is a fantastic publisher. They embrace open source material. And I was a reviewer for one of the books. Uh, this book is uh, actually a graphics engine book. Um, it's a wrapper for OpenGL in Java. It's like the Java equivalent of Unity. Um, don't ask for more. I will put stuff in the video description. And you can, there's also my website, so you can go and actually see more, more about it. Um, so why am I showing you this? Because I kind of personally want to do... Um, this is a working title. I'm not sure I'll, I'll use the t this title. Uh, the Complete Guide to Data-Oriented Design in C. From Game Programming to Rocket Launch Simulations. What I kind of want to do is use my experience, which is... Admittedly, not that much. I'm only 23. My experience with programming, and and distill that into a book form, but like being aware of what the curse of knowledge is, because that's something I've studied for a long time, and I kind of want to show people how to get to an understanding of the terminology for programming, um, and then have use cases of experts, like let's say Casey, who writes a program and discusses a program in this book. Um, after I sort of explain the topics and they follow through that program and at the end you have challenges like you know it's time, it's time for you to practice using this data oriented way um, and that's interesting that's a very interesting thing it, it, um, these challenges will be solved by me hopefully um, as programming streams maybe or as videos so when the user has read about the terminology, when he has read about what data-oriented design is in some specific topics, simple topics, going to more advanced topics, they can see the use case from an expert, of, of an expert doing a program on the book, and then they can do challenges in which they can check against the answers that I've provided in, let's say, uh, video form. And the topics I might cover is game programming, rocket launch simulations, um, pretty much anything. When, if you know data-oriented design, I kind of don't even like the term data-oriented design because it's just programming. 
really, if, if you remember the beginning of the talk. Uh, but yeah, we got to sort of differentiate this between everything else. So that's a working title. And to show how serious I am about this, um, I have recently been contacted by a publisher, Pact Publishing, and I was offered uh, to become the author for a Java modular programming book. It's literally de uh, developing enterprise applications in Java to deploy on a server, create web applications using Java in a modular way. By modular, they mean reusing functionality so you don't repeat yourself, right? Um, I've been offered that and I accept it because in the contract it says if I uh, do other works and by other works, hint, hint, this book, they are in, they might be interested in publishing This is my attempt well. at making things a little bit better. Um, you also noticed that I was very ranty and I was very passionate about some of these things because I am. And that doesn't mean I'm not open to arguments, right? Counter arguments. And I'm open to different types of comments. I don't mind and I can change my mind but this is what I want to do and I'm really serious about it because you guys uh, the people at least in the chat know I do not enjoy the programming language of Java because they restrict the way you can solve problems using the computer using the hardware using the memory right I don't really like Java at all but I'm still gonna go into the lines den and write this book in the most straightforward way as possible using Java uh, so it's a good book and then uh, use that as leverage to create this other one. Um, and with, you know, again, with the company, Pack Publishing, the, um, they embrace open source. You can download the code. It's DRM free. So it seems really good. It's going pretty well. Um, they've been really generous with the royalties. Royalties. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting thing. So if you're interested, that's kind of my thing. Um, and I want uh, to encourage you, uh, sort of do your own thing as well like what can you do uh, to show people you know what programming is really all about because it's actually really fun um, and it's really interesting and I kind of don't want people to be blindfolded and feel like my friend on the video game health bar story just like be extremely blinded to uh, the truth of how straightforward and easy programming can be and fun challenging in a way that is not dogmatic so I really appreciate it thank you so much for this uh, time of yours to watch this and you know I will see you around my Twitter is exactly my name my first and last name like the website is just at Abner Coimbre if you want to keep you know yourself uh, posted with the book and with other stuff that I might be doing and make sure you check out uh, Handmade Hero because it is a fantastic series if you want a solution now uh, Handmade Hero is one of those solutions. Um, and also keep track of Jonathan Blow, his programming language, uh, Jai, which embraces this sort of data-oriented approach, which is, you know, the approach. Uh, so, again, I appreciate it, and I will see you guys in the future.